everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. Really nice to see you all. Um, my name is Mansi, and this is Kevin, and we're really looking forward to presenting this tutorial for you all on analyzing coastal erosion using Python and satellite imagery. A little bit about each of us. Um, as I said, my name is Mansi. My background is kind of varied. I have a background in environmental science and also data science. Um, and we are both currently at Planet. So at Planet, I work as a software engineer on the developer relations team. Um, and in my spare time, when I'm not working, I'm also a musician. So love playing music and connecting with people that way. Hey, does this work? Nice. I'm Kevin. Um, I'm, off to, I'm also a software engineer on the developer relations team at Planet. Uh, also, the strange background, not in earth imaging at all. Uh, in fact, in, in astrophysics. So basically the same thing, but pointing the camera the other way. Um, and uh, on the spare time, I do a lot of mountain biking and just exploring nature. And uh, hopefully, if the weather holds up, I can try and ride some mountains out here. So um, we wanted to mention this because neither of us had I guess maybe Kevin a little bit more than me, but specifically, specific experience working with satellite imagery before we came to Planet. So we just want to stress that we're really excited that y'all are here, even if you've never worked with geospatial imagery before, or don't know the first thing about it, or maybe you've never even heard the word geospatial before today, that's totally fine. Um, we sort of came to it at Planet, and we're really excited to share it with you. So in today's workshop, we will first talk about some core geospatial and computer vision concepts that are used in remote sensing. And then we will use this understanding in, in the context of Python to use Python tools to do some of this raster and uh, imagery processing and analysis. And this sort of example section, we're gonna be using flood data for this part of it. And then we're gonna take everything that we've learned and then Kevin is gonna take us through a real world example of analyzing coastal erosion using all of this. So before I get into this further, I'm just curious, can I have a show of hands who is totally new to Python in general? Okay, cool. Um, and anyone new to geospatial imagery? Awesome, yeah, great. All right, so before we get into this, I think it's important to talk about why we're talking about coastal erosion in the first place. So, um, coastal erosion is defined as the loss or displacement of land on coastlines due to waves, currents, tide, wind, waterborne ice, storm impact, and other natural and unnatural forces. So the natural weathering of coastlines is normal, but human-led activities has unfortunately made this worse. And bad news, it's gonna get a lot worse. Um, according to the Intergovernmental pa Panel on Climate Change, risk related to sea level rise, including erosion along all low-lying coasts, is expected to significantly increase by the end of the century without major adaptation efforts. Um, so it's not looking good unless we do something about it. And this also has long-term environmental and financial impacts. Um, the long-term impacts of coastal erosion include things like loss of habitat quality, degradation of coral reefs, increased turbidity of water, reduced tolerance for communities in the face of these natural disasters, and reduced sand volume. So these environmental impacts are in addition to the millions of dollars that are gonna be lost or spent annually on coastal property loss, tourism collapse, and erosion control measures, and that's in the US alone. So overall, a bit of a downer of a slide, but I think it's important to talk about why these issues matter and why it's really important that we are looking at this data. Um, all right, let's take a second to talk about planets imagery. Thanks, Monty. Um, yeah, I couldn't really see earlier. Has anyone worked with satellite imagery before? Yeah, has anyone worked with CubeSats? Yeah, cool, a few of you. Cool, so here at Planet, well, not here, well, at Planet, we have uh, two different types of satellites. We have small little CubeSats, 
which we have little little builds of here. Uh, they're like the size of like a shoebox. They're not very big. They're like five kilograms, ten pounds each, uh, and they they're pretty powerful cameras. They have eight bands, everything between blue and near infrared, which we'll talk about later. And um, they allow you to image stuff like roads, cars, um, crops, that sort of stuff. And then we have larger satellites, uh, SkySats. Actually, I'll, I'll mention uh, the doves, the little ones, uh, we don't tell them to do anything. They just take images all the time. Whereas the SkySats, these guys are larger. They're like the size of like a mini fridge, pretty heavy, like 100 kilograms, 200 pounds and they, uh, we can tell them what to do. So we just, we'll say, hey, image this part of New York over the next you know, month with these sort of parameters. And uh, it'll do that. And um, yeah, these things are pretty high resolution. You can image stuff like you know, helipads, um, pools, smaller, smaller objects. It's used a lot for like, disaster relief, for instance. Um, and they have the SkySats have um, different types of bands. They have a specifically a really high resolution band called a, a pan band, but we're not really going to get into that today because we're going to look at Dove satellite imagery. Um, also, if you have any questions about any of this stuff, please just like shout out your question or like raise your hand because this can get kind of technical. And uh, here's a little video of, of how our satellites work. So here's the Earth rotating around. Uh, and then this is you know, a GIF of like how our satellites go around the Earth. So they, the cameras are always on, taking multiple pictures every second. And as the Earth goes around, the satellites cover more and more of the Earth. Um, and the same goes with the SkySats. They're in a similar type of orbit. And then we have the SkySats going in another orbit. Again, we're not really talking about SkySats today, but it's just kind of interesting. These are meant just to cover more more parts of the Earth, or like let's say you want to take pictures of the Earth multiple times in one day. Um, and it's kind of it's kind of fun, you know. These these purple lines that you see here, if you can kind of resolve that with your eye, uh, are just are imaginary strips of images that just are composited into one picture of the Earth. You can kind of picture it as like a Google Maps image once a day, which is pretty uh, pretty sweet and pretty pretty powerful tool. It can be used to like monitor forestry, like deforestation or crop yields or you know, different, different things that you might want to monitor every day. Or flooding, for instance, that we'll talk about later today. Do you have any questions about that? No? Cool. I'll hand over to Monzi. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. All right, so um, we're going to start by talking about some core geospatial concepts that'll come in handy when we get a little bit further along. So uh, the first thing to note about geospatial data is that it's special and behaves differently than maybe a regular image would. Um, geospatial raster imagery, first thing to note is that it can be multispectral, meaning that one image can be made up of different bands, and we'll get to this in a second. Geospatial raster imagery is also spatially referenced, which means when you see an image of the Earth that's a geospatial raster, that image is tied to a very specific place on the Earth's surface. And that information is also included in that image's metadata. So it's a, an important part about how we work with that image. All right, so multispectral imagery um, here, we're looking at an image of San Francisco on the right. That image, you're looking at it, it's a color image, it's how you might see it with your own eyes. That image is actually made up of bands. In this case, we have the red band, the green band, and the blue band. Um, these bands represent different areas on the wavelength spectrum. So the red band is uh, representative of the red wavelengths, green for green, and blue for blue. A note here is that we can also have bands that we can't see with our eyes. An example of this is near infrared. We can't see that, but we can have that as information uh, with our data. Um, another thing to note about working with this imagery is that because these bands are part of the image, 
you might need to work with it slightly differently than you would a regular image. So for those of you who have worked with geospatial imagery before, if you've ever had the experience of downloading an image, then you use your preview app or whatever the equivalent of um, that is on Windows. Um, and you try to look at your image and it's all black or all gray and you can't see anything. And I've definitely been there where I have a mini freak out and I think that, oh my gosh, like my computer's broken, what's happening? Your computer's not broken. It's just because um, the image has these bands that not all programs can process. So you would need to put this image into like a QGIS, for example, or similar program for it, uh, you to be able to see it properly. Another thing to note is that the pixels in raster imagery can be represented as arrays. So take this image here on the right, say it's a beach scene. So we have forest, we have sand, and we have water. Um, you can imagine that all of the water pixels are represented uh, with similar values. All of the sand pixels have similar values to each other, and then all of the forest pixels also have similar values. Um, this is especially important to consider because to manipulate a raster image, we can manipulate it by manipulating the arrays that make up that image. And so we'll see this in action um, in a little bit when we use NumPy and Rasterio to kind of work with these images. All right, let's talk about resolution. You might have heard this uh, word, idea of resolution. It's a term that's used a lot and kind of thrown around when we're talking about satellite imagery, but there are actually several different types of resolution. So I just wanna break that down for y'all. Um, let's take this image on the previous slide. So let's pretend we're looking at this. If we have spatial resolution, um, see, say that we're on this beach that we just saw in the last slide. If we're curious about what area on the ground is taken up by one pixel on that image, that would be spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is talking about the ground area per pixel. So say in that image, one pixel is a three meter by three meter square. The spatial resolution of that image is gonna be a three meter spatial resolution. Then we have temporal resolution. This is talking about the frequency between image captures. So say we go to this beach, say we went to this beach in, in COVID 2020, um, and then we went to the beach uh, last year, 2022, and then say we're planning a trip to that same beach next year, 2024. The temporal resolution, and we, we take images at each visit um, to the beach. The temporal resolution of these images is gonna be two years, a two-year temporal resolution because we take images every two years. Then we have spectral resolution. This is talking about the number of spectral bands that are being measured. So say in that image, just let's just pretend that we have a red band a blue band and a green band, just a simple visual image, our spectral resolution would be three because we have three bands. And then finally, uh, radiometric resolution. This is talking about bit depth of pixel values. Another way to say this is how much information, how much data is captured by each pixel. And this can be a little bit confusing to understand, but I think something that helps us thinking about this as color resolution. So the more data that uh, a pixel holds the higher the color, the better color you'll see. And I like this example. Um, I can pull it up for you guys. If I can find my mouse. Okay. All right, so this is just on Wikipedia. So you can see, you all see this, yes, okay. Um, this image down here, this, it's the same image of the leaf. This one at the bottom has a one bit um, resolution. It looks kind of gray. You almost can't tell it's a leaf because none of the reds or greens or purples are showing properly. But if you look at this higher resolution here, you can see all the colors. You can tell it's a leaf that has water drops on it, all this stuff. So that is kind of um, bit depth uh, in action. Any questions on any of that before we move on? Great. Okay, so let's talk about some of the geospatial tools and libraries we are gonna be using as we look more at this data. 
Um, so we have some foundational software. We're really big, especially at Planet, about using open source tooling. Um, so we have things like GDAL and Proj that are kind of the base level foundational software. And then today we're specifically gonna be using a few libraries, Rasterio uh, and NumPy, which are used to read and write raster data um, and arrays and then matplotlib for plotting, and then OpenCV as a computer vision library for some image processing. All right, so this, uh, we promised y'all this would be an interactive workshop. So here's where we get to the interactive piece of it. Um, if you all could please go to this link, it's go.planet.com slash coastal erosion. And I try to make this as fun as possible. I know it's the last day of tutorials, post-lunch food coma setting in probably. All right, so here's that link again. So when you get to this page, you should see something, oh, not like that. Avert your eyes. You should see something like this. Is everyone generally here? I can put that link back up if y'all need it. Good? Okay, great. Um, so we are going to run through some examples of working with imagery uh, and some of the analysis steps that we will uh, use and sort of put together for the full coastal erosion analysis that Kevin will lead us through. Later. So what you're looking at right now is a, uh, it's our notebooks repo at Planet. It has a bunch of code examples and things. We'll talk about this more generally later. But this is our coastal erosion um, folder. So for this tutorial, we're going to be going through this using Jupyter Notebooks um, and specifically Google Colab. Who has never used Jupyter Notebooks before? Awesome. We're all very familiar. Yes. Okay. No. Oh yeah, sure. Here's the link again. Yep. Okay, so since you're all familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, we're gonna be doing this in Google Colab. So this will make it so that you don't have to download any data, you don't have to worry about any of that. It's all just gonna be there. Um, so if you all wouldn't mind going to this first notebook, one underscore rest stereo underscore first look. And if you could open this in a separate tab because we will be coming back to this page later. And when you get there, it should look something like this. And then when you're here, you wanna click on this blue button that says open and collab. And that will open this notebook for you in a collab instance. So you should be looking at something like this. Is everyone generally here? Feel free to flag me down at any point if you want a link again or anything like that. Okay. So in this first notebook, we are gonna be looking at reading multispectral data with REST stereo. Um, things just like grabbing the bands, and sort of initially starting to work with it. So uh, in working with Google Colab, just a quick note, if you would like to change any of this code here, maybe experiment with stuff on your own, or you wanna save the output that you get, nothing will automatically save. But if you wanna save it, you can go to this file and then save a copy right there. So that's one way to save it. Um, another thing to note about working on this in Colab, Every notebook we work with, we're gonna have to grab the data. So to do that, you're gonna have to run this first cell where it says option one, run Google Colab. So to run a cell, you'll notice if you hover over the cell, there's that play button looking thing. Just click on that. It'll give you a warning saying notebook was not authorized by Google, or authored by Google. You can run anyway, if you trust me. 
I know y'all just met me, but it's fine. I'm not trying to put any malware on your computers or anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Let's see. Is that better? Okay. And then the way to tell that a cell is finished running in Google Colab, I know it's kind of difficult to see, there's this green check mark right next to the play button, and if you see that, that means that cell has run. So we're all good. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna load our data set. So we're gonna import our Restereo package, and then we're gonna point uh, this image file variable to our image file. And then we're gonna establish our open data object using restereo.open and we're gonna call that open image sat.satellite data. So you can see here that that's the name of our open satellite data object. And then we can look at some basic information about this object. So we have the name of the data set, uh, this looks like a random string of numbers. This is actually the date, the beginning part of this, 2017, 831, is the date that this image we're working with uh, was taken on. For context, we're gonna be working with imagery from Hurricane Harvey in 2017 in Texas, in Houston. So this is real imagery that was used to aid recovery efforts um, and sort of help people on the ground at the time. And we're gonna be using that imagery for this series of examples to kind of help guide us through. And then you can also see the number of bands in this data set. So here, sat.count, we see we have three bands. And then we can look at the indexes of the bands. One thing to note here, if you're used to doing stuff in Python, uh, Python in indexes by zero. So if you have a list of objects, the first uh, item in that list is gonna be in the zeroth place. For bands, they are one indexing. So the first band is one, second band is two, and third band is three. Just something quirky to know about working with bands. And because we know the kind of imagery we're working with, in this case, a planet scope three band image, we know our band order. So we can kind of establish that and then call our bands by name. So here, we're just assigning blue, green, and red to our bands. Then we can print the data type of our bands just to check they're stored as NumPy arrays. And then using the blue band as an example, we can just look at the width and height of our image in pixels. So this particular image that we're working with is around 8.3 uh, thousand pixels wide and then almost 4,000 pixels high. Any questions about this first notebook, just kind of bringing up the data in Rastereo? Great. All right, moving right along. So now we're going to work with Rastereo in our image to extract bands and compose a scene. So we're gonna take our different bands and then bring them together to uh, kind of see in action how the bands come together to form an image. So now you'll wanna go back to this page. Um, if you didn't open it up in a different tab, I'll pull up the link again. Here's that link. So you wanna go back there, and now we're gonna do the second notebook. So open up this two underscore rest stereo um, notebook in a separate tab, and then click on that blue open in collab button and you should be looking at this. All right, everyone generally here? Okay, great. So again, we're gonna need to do this every time. So if you're running this in Colab, go ahead and run this first cell that just grabs our data for us. Taking a 
while. All right, great. So we've got our data. Now we can install our packages again. So we have Rasterio again, but we're also going to be using NumPy this time and matplotlib dot pyplot. So again, we want to grab our image. We're going to open it. We have our open data set object. Now we're going to look at the image metadata. So we can do this by doing sat.crs. So we see here that it says um, this is to get the image's coordinate reference system, and we see the output is EPSG 32615. Um, this is not something that I know. This might be looking to you like some gibberish something. Um, this corresponds to WGS 84 World Geodetic System 84 UTM 15 North. Um, this I wouldn't know unless I had just looked it up before this. So it's not something that I have memorized. It's just this EPSG code corresponds to this projection. And because we know this projection, um, we know that the units, the projected units of this are in meters. So then because we know that, we can look at this minimum bounding box and these units are in meters. So this is the bounding box of our image in meters. We can also get the um, dimensions of the image also in projected units. So the dimensions of this image in meters are some 25,000-ish meters by 11,700. We can also look at the dimensions of this image in pixels like we did in the previous notebook. So we see those numbers right here. And then because we know the dimensions of this image in meters, and we also know the dimensions in pixels, we can use this to figure out our spatial resolution. So if we divide our um, meter units by our pixel units for height and width, um, we see that we have a three meter resolution, three meter by three meter. Um, just a quick check, are the pixels square? Yes, they are. I don't know a case in which the pixels won't be square, um, but I guess good to see. So yes, they are indeed square in this case. And then we can convert our pixel coordinates on our image to geographic coordinates on the globe. So we take the upper left pixel, the lower right pixel, this minus one is here because the rows and columns are zero indexing. And then we can transform them. And then here we have our UTM coordinates in meters. And then all of this information, or at least a lot of it, is captured here in this uh, set that dot profile. So we can see the, um, the width and the height in pixels. We can see the band count. We can see the coordinate reference system, the transformation, all these things are right in here. All right, so let's figure out how we can compose a scene now that we know how to get to our bands. So again, we're just gonna do a quick look. Yes, we have three bands, one, two, three. And again, because we know that we are looking at a three band planet scope image, we know our band order. So that's what this is, just assigning the names here. And then to construct our visual image, all we do is we do numpy.dstack and we put all those images together, or all those bands together. So that is our visual image. And then we can view it. All right. Here is our image. Was everyone able to get here? If you didn't stack them like that or only stack a couple, could you look at the individual bands? Like, would that be a strategy for looking at the data like that? You could, yeah. If you switch the order, the colors would also come out differently. Yeah, so you could play around with it. Bless you. Uh, one thing to note here, so this is um, the flood area. This brown stuff here, that's actually water. 
that's the sort of flooded area of Houston. Is anyone from Houston? No, okay, I was just wondering. Um, so it's important to note that this brown muddy water is what we're gonna be uh, looking to identify. And then also note that we have these clouds here. These white specks are clouds. Clouds are basically the bane of uh, people who work with imagery like us, like our existence. We hate clouds. Um, especially on top of snow. Especially on top of snow, yes. Yeah, what's cloud? What is snow? What's water? We have no idea. Um, yeah, so this is part of the, the reason that I bring this up is because these clouds might be identified as water when we get into our NDWI calculations. So just something to keep in mind. Um, ideally, if you can get imagery without clouds, that would be perfect. I know that's not always possible. Um, there are sometimes techniques you can use to remove clouds. Um, I know Planet has a data product that's a usable data mask where it'll just mask over the areas that are clouds or not usable. So if you have that kind of thing available, that's also um, good to use. All right, moving right along. Let's go back here and we're gonna open up number three. Notebook number three, um, compute NDWI. And again, go ahead and run this first cell to get the data. So here we're gonna talk about what NDWI is. We're gonna calculate it for our image. Um, and then we're gonna visualize this data and then create a, a mask, a land mask and a water mask from this NDWI. Okay. So import packages, get our data. So here we're gonna calculate NDWI. Um, NDWI stands for Normalized Difference Water Index. And th uh, this index is related to plant water content and it helps identify areas of water on the ground. So to calculate the NDWI, you can take the green band, subtract the near infrared band, and then divide that by the green band plus the near infrared band. So the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna allow division by zero. This is because our image might have, have sections of the image that are clipped um, or masked already or already have values of zero. And when we do this division, the denominator can also be zero. And if that happens, we don't want our code to just completely stop working. So here we're just allowing division by zero. Then we can extract the bands we're gonna need for the NDWI. So in this case, you'll notice we're using a four band image instead of a three band image. So we have our blue, green, red, and the near infrared band. And then once we have these bands, we can go ahead and calculate our NDWI with that same calculation, green minus NIR plus over green plus NIR. So now this NDWI object um, will show us NDWI values that we can use for further analysis. So we can look at what this looks like. So here's our NDWI. We see that the darker blue areas are the areas that are identified as water and have the higher NDWI values and the lower values, uh, the lighter blue, lower NDWI values are the areas that are maybe not classified as water. Um, so generally NDWI values range from negative one to positive one, anything around, there's different literature on this of course, but generally 0 0.3 and up will be NDWI values associated with being water. Um, and then NDWI values lower than 0 0.3 are less likely to be associated with being water. Um, so with this threshold, we could use 0 0.3 
as I just mentioned, but because I, we know that we're working with murky water, it's flood water, so the boundary between water and land is not as clear as maybe like a coastline or um, a lake or something where it's more clearly defined, we're gonna relax our threshold a bit. So we're gonna say um, that, uh, actually, I think I'm jumping ahead of myself. I think this is in the next notebook. All right, so here we're uh, creating masks, but we will visualize these very soon. So let's go back here. And we're gonna go to number four, masks and filters. All right, so same thing here. Do all the usual, usual things. All right, so the first part of this notebook is just a kind of repeat of what we just did. So we're gonna do the NDWI calc again, import our packages, get our imagery, allow division by zero, get our bands, NDWI calc, and generate a mask. So we can take a look at this here. This is showing according to our NDWI that we just calculated, our water mask, so areas of water, that those are the purple areas. Um, and then down here, if you run this next code cell, you can see areas identified as land according to our threshold. So you'll notice it's pretty fragmented. We know according to our eyes when we saw that previous image, this area in the top right of the image, a lot more of that was probably water. For some reason it's not identifying it that way, but we know that it is water. And then same with this land. There's a lot of gaps here and we can probably tell that some of these gaps are land, but they're not being classified as being land currently. So to kind of help this, we are going to apply filters to our mask. So this is where that OpenCV library comes in. So we're going to be using morphological filters using OpenCV to kind of help us improve this uh, land versus water segmentation. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna be doing two different types of operations, a closing and an opening um, filter. These are both, uh, these, honestly, I am frequently confused by these because they just seem confusing and you'll see why in a second. Um, so the opening operation is basically removing false positives. So you're taking uh, empty pixels outside of a mask, outside of the mask, and then the closing operation is removing false negatives. So that's for filled pixels inside of the mask. I find it a lot easier to look at this. So this is the OpenCV documentation. So this opening filter, so you're taking these white specks outside of the main image, you're getting rid of those. And then the closing, you're taking the sort of dark filled specks inside the image and getting rid of them. The reason this is so personally confusing for me is because I feel like the names should be switched. So if you are also confused, just think of them switched. That's what I do. If that's confusing you more, ignore what I just said. All right, so what this is doing is this is uh, taking a kernel, like a box, um, with the size that we have defined. So um, these sizes, by the way, the 40 and the 15, those are kind of arbitrary. Ideally, if you're doing this for a project where you wanna be a little more nuanced about how you approach this, you could do something like a grid search maybe where you try out all different values of opening and closing um, kernel sizes and then you can see 
what, say if you have a ground truth image that you're comparing against, what combination of sizes gives you the best um, sort of final outcome? This is just a bit arbitrary right now, so these numbers don't um, sort of hang on to them too tightly. They can change. Um, but that kernel will go over the image, and then depending on what we decided, it'll open and close those holes accordingly. So in this cell, we're applying the closing filter, and then to that resulting image, we're applying the opening filter, and that will give us our final um, filtered image. And then we can see this image. And here we go. So the dark purple areas are areas of water. You'll notice this looks a lot more filled in than the previous image that we saw uh, without before we applied these. Um, of course, you can definitely continue to refine these as you wish. You'll also notice here on the left side of the image, these specks are probably that those are the clouds. That's why we hate clouds. Clouds are great, but not today. Um, yeah, so just know that these are probably showing up here because of those clouds, but this, the area identified on the right is going to be water. All right, almost there. Last notebook. Number five, uh, plotting a histogram. And this, we are just kind of doing this. Um, this will make a lot more sense when Kevin leads us through the full coastal erosion example in a bit. But we're looking at the sort of distribution of the pixel values um, for each of the bands to kind of see where they fall. All right, so here we're just gonna see how we can plot our bands and their values um, in a histogram. So we're gonna grab our image like we did before and get our three bands. We're using a four band planet scope image here. So we're using blue, green, red, and IR. But for the purposes of this, we're just gonna look at the BRG, uh, blue, green, red for the histogram. And here we are plotting our histogram, so we're establishing title, labels, colors, bins, all these things. All right, so here we go. On the x-axis, we see the pixel values in our image for each of the three bands. And then on the y-axis, we see the number of pixels at those values. So you might notice here, if we're looking at the blue band, that the blue band pixel values, um, they're the most number of pixels uh, in the blue band, which might make sense because we have a lot of water. This image is flooded and we have clouds. So that might make sense. And you'll see the values are around um, 8,000. Um, oh, sorry, wrong axis, right here, 7,000. Um, the pixel values where it peaks right here is around 7,000. So um, this, you might be wondering why this is or maybe curious about it. I went into, let's see if I can pull this up on this. So I went into QGIS because I was curious about this. Um, and I noticed that this is just filtering for the blue band, so you can see the blue band. Um, but clicking around at different values, this, the areas where it's blue here, the, the blue band tends to be around that 7,000 mark. So that might be one of the reasons why we see this peak happening at the 7,000 mark is because so much of this image is flooded and that flood water is around that, 
those pixel values. So this will make a lot more sense in context when Kevin talks about this in the context of the coastal erosion example, um, but I just wanted to introduce this concept of pixel values in histograms. Any questions? I know this was a lot. We'll have time for questions at the end too, yes. Yeah, that's like, so let's see if I go back here. This um, slide, so if you think about like each of the colors or each of the different um, things represented in imagery having different values just because of how they're represented um, in the array, that's what that's talking about. Oh, yeah. Something like that, yeah. It's a brightness value. Cool. Um, so, uh, all of this, um, hope that y'all have a better understanding of how to work with geospatial imagery using NumPy, REST Stereo, all these things. Um, so, I think we'll take a few minute break, maybe like a 15 minute break. Now, just so y'all can, you know, stretch and all the things. Um, please feel free to get more of the swag if you haven't already. And then when we come back, Kevin will take us through an example, looking at coastal erosion, kind of bringing all this stuff together in a full real-world example. Oh, um, two twenty, so two thirty-five. Fifteen minutes. All right, everyone. Is everyone uh, good to go? Cool, all right, thumbs up. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next section, well, the last section, uh, which is the hands-on example. Well, everything's really been hands-on, but the next hands-on example, which is where we analyze coastal erosion in a specific area. Let me move this mouse out of the way. There we go. Cool. So. Uh, Monzi did a really great job of explaining everything earlier of how you get your data in, how you analyze geospatial data, um, how you create image processing pipelines, and how you create masks and all these things. Now we're going to put that to the test for real world. I mean, the other stuff was also real world, but more real world data. So this was inspired by a recent paper where they were looking at a severe uh, example of coastal erosion in Bangladesh. And before I go any further, because the Wi-Fi is slow, um, I'm just gonna have you download the data. So let's go back to the notebooks repo, and then go to the coastal analysis uh, Jupyter notebook at the very bottom. Um, and then I'll go back and talk about it a little bit. Then open up in Colab. And then just run the first cell to install REST Serio and then also get the data. Because instead of this being like one image, this is uh, great. Oh yeah, right, okay. So some of you might see this uh, screen. This is basically just saying you have a lot of stuff open, so just go ahead and close them. I'll just go terminate other sessions, yeah, cool. And then go ahead and download that data. So instead of this being one image, uh, this is 12 or so images. So it's a lot of data. Um, I'll go back to my slide quickly. So in this example, we're gonna look at a coastal erosion example from this area in Bangladesh. Um, it was inspired by this paper I put on the bottom. I'll just show you a quick little snippet from the paper. Here's like the real world, wow, this is kind of small, the real world uh, version of like where we're gonna look on the ground. They've been trying to put seawalls up to try and reduce coastal erosion, but um, for many reasons it hasn't worked. And the 
area of interest, or the AOI, as I'll be referring to it, is just a small, small section of the actual area that they've been analyzing. This is the small section here, by the way. So the, our end goal is to get this filled out area. This is like the little chunk of land that's just been receded away into the ocean. Let's go check on our data. Okay, worked for me. Does everyone else have, everyone else have the data? Is everyone, is anyone from here? You are, yeah? Why is it so dry? <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't know if anyone else feels this, but like, my face is just shrinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm from like Vancouver, like Pacific Northwest, where it's just like tropical, but cold, cold tropics, you know? Yeah, the opposite, yeah. Pardon me? Oh, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Well, let's, let's get these packages in. Um, well, maybe I'll talk a bit about this stuff. Um, well, I sort of already did. I'll, say I'll talk about it anyway. So we're going to do the same thing that Monzi did earlier in the five notebooks, but in one, to no in one notebook. So we're going to get the data that we're going to look at. So we're going to look at both visual data, which is like the red, green, blue data that you can combine to one pretty picture, and the analytic data, which is like the data that you can, uh, you can analyze the bands and make like the, the normalized difference water index image out of. And then we're going to create that index image, so the NDWI image. And then from that, we're going to look at the pixels and how we can identify water and land, and then try and measure the recession over time. Okay, cool. And just from like a, geograph a geographical perspective, this is like a Google Maps capture of where this area of interest or AOI is. So that's Bangladesh, that's the southern part of Bangladesh, and it's just a small little polygon. Um, in reality, it's much, much larger where the recession is happening, as I mentioned earlier, but it would be so much data to do, and I don't know if our instances can handle it, to be honest. <laughs> So we import our data, didn't miss anything, very good. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna just like get pointers to where this data it is, and then we're gonna sort it by date. So we have data from 2017 up until 2023, so six years of data. Um, as, Monty as Monty mentioned earlier, you can do this all on your local computer, like you can grab this data, do it on your local computer. Um, the only thing that won't work is this part here, where I import the files. I have like a backslash or a forward slash. Uh, this works for like Ubuntu and Linux and whatever, um, and Macs, but it doesn't work for Windows. You have to reverse that slash. And maybe more things. Yeah? Date. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I named, named them 2017 underscore, or year underscore visual or, or analytic. So it would sort them 2017 through 2023. Yeah, there's, there's better ways of doing it um, using metadata to be more robust, but in this case I just did the easy, <laughs> easy way. But that's a good question. I could really be wrong if I wasn't careful. Okay, so now we have um, two different lists of data. The analytic images, are, again, are the images that aren't the pretty images. They're the ones that we're going to be using for our science purposes. And then the visual images are just going to be the pretty images. Um, so we're going to create a function. Uh, I'm assuming, has everyone here created functions in Python before? Yeah, cool, so it's nothing new. So um, creating a function here, a pretty simple function. Um, it's what we've done earlier for extracting the bands using Rasterio, but we're gonna call it multiple times, so I'm just gonna throw it into a function. And we're specifically gonna be using green and near infrared 
as Monzi mentioned earlier, that's all we really care about for the NDWI. So I'm just going to run that to save that. Cool, cool. Okay, so I'm going to run through the whole example using just the 2023 image, and then at the end we'll kind of combine it all with the whole the whole thing. So, um, you know, the only thing that doesn't index by one is, or sorry, everything indexes from zero to you know negative one for your last one. So um, negative one in this case is going to refer to the last image in our list of images. In this case, 2023. And we're going to uh, extract the spectral bands for uh, the 2023 image. So here we have green and NIR for near infrared. And then, um, well, let's just visualize it, right? So here's the green image, right? Not really much to see, a lot of green. Uh, this little part here is a sandy section, which comes up as really green, kind of interesting. I'm not really sure why. Um, some of you might. Did I say anyone know why <laughs> sand looks green? No, I don't really know. Okay, cool. Uh, and then the next section is the, uh, look at that, typo. I plot the red image. Nope, near infrared. So we're going to plot the near infrared. And so does anyone here know why the near infrared looks really bright in uh, land and not bright for water? So near infrared is a proxy for temperature in a lot of cases. So the water temperature is going to be much cooler than the land temperature. So the land looks really bright compared to the water. That's what's happening here. And then here we're going to create another function to compose the scene. So um, as we've done earlier with the visual imagery, we can just stack the blue, the green, and the red to create a visual or a, an array for a visual imagery a visual image. Then let's go ahead and run that for the 2023 image. And boom, here we go. This is what the visual image looks like for 2023. And this was taken in like April. This is April. This was taken recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cool, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll mention this here. There's a little thing here. I'm still not really sure what it is, but it appears like every year in the spring. And you'll see in the masks later, it kind of pops up as land. So I'm gonna guess this is either like a really shallow part of water or murky or maybe a little island, I don't know. Doesn't matter. Uh, we're gonna mask it out, so. Uh, the next part, we're going to compute our NDWI. So green minus red over the sum of them. And we're going to, like Monty said earlier, ignore zero. Kind of scary if you're in the math world, but let's just pretend it's OK. Um, the main reason, actually, I'll just show you visually why we're doing that. These black parts here are zero. So when you divide by zero, this would explode, and so would that. So yeah, we're just letting it still be zero. Uh, OK, doo -doo -doo. let's compute the NDWI for 2023. Let's take a look at it. Cool, OK. So you see that little island thing I was talking about? Yeah, we're just going to pretend that's water. So we're going to mask that out later. But in general, we have ocean, land, this is not really important, but a little river in here that kind of messes with our stuff later. So sorry about that. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, the zero point is what we're going to be taking for uh, what is and isn't water. Or maybe I do 0 0.3. Oh, I do zero. <laughs> It'll be zero. So basically, anything less than zero, we're going to say is land. Anything more, water. OK, so another function, let's define how to find water and land. So it's going to take in the NDWI image, or array. And then it's going to throw out two different uh, masks, the water mask and the land mask. Just how I mentioned earlier, if, it's more than, if the NDWI 
pixel is more than zero, water, if it's less, uh, land. And do I say equal to? Yeah, so if it's more than or equal to, we'll just say it's water. Okay, so um, so what we're doing here is we're creating images um, that will say if the value is one, it's equal to, let's just say the water mask. If the value is one, the pixel is associated with water. If it's zero, it's associated with not water. And the same goes for the land mask. So if it's one, it's land, not one, it's not land. The word mask is kind of a funny word, but it really just means like ones are the things that you're associating with and zero are things you're not. Um, here we're just gonna compute them. Here's what like the NumPy array looks like for, in this case, a land mask. Um, I'll just scroll up quickly to the NDWI image. You can see like there's water and then there's land. So you expect there to be ones down here and not ones here. And that's what we got. And I will correct myself. Earlier I said zeros and ones. In this case, it'll be ones and then nans. I did do zeros in a previous iteration of this notebook, but it kind of messed with some other things later. So I said it was nan. And then uh, let's just visualize what these water and land masks look like. So, water mask with that pesky island in the way. And then land mask, this all kind of adds up, right? You have that little river in here. Does this make sense, everyone? Yeah? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, do they not look like exact negatives? Well, like so, one has an island and one doesn't. Like oh, oh. Gotcha. Uh, well, let me take a look. Why don't they look like that? This is the beauty of live programming. Um. Pardon me? On cell you have land mask, NWI, less than water threshold, but not less than Haha, yes. Thank you. That's why. But wouldn't that still fully encompass all the values? Oh. You're right, and then you might expect there to be a river over here, and I'm just confused now. Um, yeah, should we change it? You guys up for it? Let's just say equal. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Of course. This is this is my second time for coding. Okay. Let's see. Boom. Here. No. Well, let's just pretend like. You didn't bring up that really good point, and I'll. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point, but um, but like um, I fear your name. Oliver mentioned, uh, they should be the exact opposite because. One's just exactly greater than or equal to the threshold, and then the other one is exactly less than, so they should be just negatives. I know, I don't know why. Well, I mean, this this looks like pretty distinct from this, so I don't know. Should we just change it for fun? Let's just say 0.3. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, 
again, they're not exact opposites, so let's just ignore that. <laughs> no, that's a very good question. I don't know. Hey, do you know what you can do? Do you want to file a little GitHub issue? And then we can, we can figure that out together. I'll send you guys an invoice later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. I don't know. Does anyone else know? If not, we can just move on and pretend like it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's probably a map plot issue. In fact, you should just fit, file your ticket there. <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't know. So, um, but it doesn't really matter because we'll just mask it away. But it's a really good question now. I'm really bugged by it. Um, okay, so we have our land and water masks, kind of. Um, and like you mentioned, there's this little island, there's a little river, and um, and we want to measure the recession over time, and we don't want little artifacts like that getting in our way. So we're just going to mask away these things. Uh, we're going to mask away this little island, and we're going to mask away this little river. And throughout the years, there's different things that pop up too. There's only one year's worth of data. Um, and so you can might imagine we're going to do some opening and closing filters like we did earlier. If you take a look at this open CV thing, right? So you can imagine this is like, we'll see. Does Monzi have the zoom thing? Yeah. So this could be like the little island, and we're going to open it. And this is like the little river, and we're going to close it. Oops. There we go. So our function looks pretty much like the one earlier. So we have a closing element, a closing kernel, and then um, a mask. This is kind of a lot to just like take in, but it's, it's exactly what we did in the fourth uh, notebook, just like parameterized instead of with numbers in it. So we have a closing mask, an opening mask, we combine them, then we have masks closed and opened. And then let's do this with some real numbers. Um, so earlier we were talking about how like these numbers are kind of pulled out of thin, min, thin air, and they kind of are because I just want them to work for this example. Um, but you can also think about it as like each pixel is about three meters. In this case, they're actually 3.7 meters per, per pixel. It all depends on the data processing pipeline, and you can find this out in the metadata. But let's just say it's 3.7 meters per pixel. So in this case, our closing element will have like 29 pixels, which is, let's see, what's 29 times 3.7? So like about 690 meters. So you can like, you can picture it that way. So you can say like, you know, this island is about this big by this big in meters. That's like how much you're gonna wanna close. So you can run that there. And then let's run it for the year. Let's see what it looks like. So it got rid of that island. And it got rid of the river. Look at that. So now we have distinct masks. This one's, this one's land. This is where, all, where water is. We know where the two lie. And we can measure now where, how they're going to change over time. So let's just do this for each year. So 2023 through 2021. You'll see this plus one because we want to include the year 2021. So basically what we're doing here is we're going to extract the spectral bands. We're going to get a visual image. Um, we're not actually using this visual image, but this is here in case you want to visualize what's happening over time. You can just do a quick plot of that image for each year. Um, creating water lane masks. We're going to filter them. And then we're, we're going to add them to a list. That's all run for me. Did that run for everyone? It's going to take us a water. Okay. Um, so now let's let's see what this looks like over time. So we're going to measure how the land has changed over that over the time period over the time frame. And in this case, um, 
we can actually report out in like physical units. So we know, like I mentioned earlier, the resolution is 3.7 meters per pixel. Hard coded this, again, you can take this out of the metadata like Monsi showed earlier, but kind of lazy. So the total land lost over this time is uh, 13 square kilometers. That's massive um, over the past seven years. And um, well, it's kind of hard to visualize. So let's just go ahead and do that ourselves. So this is a plot of the land lost over seven years. As it kind of says, yeah, cumulative land loss. So let's just go back up here to take a look. So here's our, I'll just go all the way back up to like the real image. I'll just do this one. So this is, this is the NDWI. So this is where the water was, the land was. And I'll scroll all the way down here. And then this yellow stuff here is the total land mass that was lost in those seven years. Okay, cool. So let's continue. Um, so I'm going to throw time into an array from 2017 to 2023. I'm going to throw in um, uh, the land masks, land masks, and the land mass loss. And then we can plot that over time. We can see just how much land was lost over time, just in a in a plot like this. It's kind of helpful. So you can see in the first little bit, it was like accelerating, like it's incredibly fast land lost. And over the last little bit, maybe it's slowing down. Let's take a look. So we can measure that through just simple like first year physics kind of stuff, math, uh, <laughs> math, <laughs> velocity. We can do math. <sighs> anyway, so is anyone else tired? <laughs> yeah, cool. This is my first session. Like I, I shouldn't be tired. Okay, so let's measure the velocity. Uh, so that's just, yeah, uh, total land mass loss over time. So this is like the speed of how fast, mm, speed of how fast, this is how fast the land has been receding over time. So you can see, like, like we mentioned earlier, like it's speeding up, speeding up, speeding up. Then over the last year, it's kind of slowed down, which is a good thing. But not such a good thing for the first six years. Um, and then we can do the same thing for acceleration. So that's just the derivative of velocity. And then you can see <clears throat> over the first six years, it was accelerating, like it's getting really bad. And then the past year, it's getting better. It's like decelerating or accelerating negatively, um, which is good. But let's just like visualize this a little bit easier. Easierly. Easierly. Easier. Easier. A little bit easier. Hi. Help me. Yeah. I have a question about the, the change in the last year. Um, is that, does that mean that it's getting less bad? It's, it's still getting bad, but slows slower? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's not getting good, but it's getting less bad. So, so like, if, if like the velocity was zero, then there would be no landmass loss between 2022 and 2023. But the velocity is still above zero. So that means there's still land mass lost between the two years. But it's slowing down compared to the first year, which is a good thing. Oh, that would be really good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, yeah. <laughs> is it cool? I don't. Is that good? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess that's one way of doing it. I know in this region specifically, they were creating um, uh, sea walls. Yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with sea walls, but basically they're like walls put in the sea. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's a good name. Um, and it helps slow down coastal erosion, but eh, not so much in this case. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, well, I'm not sure about if it's taking a break, but I, 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 you know, it's a really good question. I'm not really sure why it's slowing down. I haven't taken too much, I haven't looked into it. This paper was actually from 2020, so all the analysis after is, it's just kind of like, we know that it's happening, we're just not really sure why. Um, in fact, this, this area of interest, like I mentioned earlier, is a really small section of like the land that, that is being lost. Let me take a, pull this back up. So like this little polygon here is fairly small compared to this, this entire coastline here. This entire coastline is being eroded. Um, and this section here is just one tiny chunk of it. And in fact, it might be accelerating. It might be actually getting a lot worse over the entire coastline. I, I don't really know. Um, it's just a small chunk of land. That's a really good, really good question. I don't know what is expected in this case, um, but if you do compare to like other beachy regions, I was, I was trying to find like an example in the US, for instance, because this kind of hits home for people. Um, and sections that like, sections of coast that I could find that had data for like 10 years were nowhere near this bad. Um, and those sections were like uh, non-human contributed those, those are by Earth, Mother Nature, yeah. And uh, it's just, this is just so much more dramatic. But I don't know what the actual answer is for like what we'd expect over time. It's a good question. Yeah. Right, okay. That's a really, that's a really uh, complicated question because, and, and I, I, I tried to, I tried to do this by, I tried to, okay, so for those who didn't hear, okay, maybe also let me know if this isn't what you're saying. You're asking, are you asking if we're not accounting for the elevation of the water, right? So, sorry, of the land? Of the land. Oh, oh, I see. Hmm. I didn't, I didn't account for that. But this section is a very, uh, well, this, again, I'm cherry picking, but this section is a very flat section. The way you can measure height is not through our satellites. You need something like LIDAR, which can tell you the height of, of land. We, we don't have that. I don't even have access to that data. Um, but this, I, I just know from the paper that this is a really flat section of land. But yeah, you're right. Like it, it could appear as though like, like coastal erosion is slowing down because, like you mentioned, it's getting, the land is becoming higher. Um, yeah, that's a good question. But I did, I did try to reduce some variables like this section, this part of Bangladesh gets um, like monsoon seasons. And so you can get really high water levels which if you look at different times, it can look like there's a false sense of coastal erosion, but it's just the water level is really high. So I chose the same, the same month um, each year, so April of each year during their dry season to try and reduce those extra variables. I know that's not what you're asking, but just another, another point. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't, I don't know about the elevation of this land. I, I just know it's pretty flat, yeah. Um, any more questions before I get on to our stuff? Um, okay, so the next section, let me see where we left off. Right, we're looking at acceleration. Okay, now we're gonna look at land recession. Now we're gonna like measure actually how fast the land is moving inward or the water in, is moving inward in this case. Um, so to do that, we are going to try and find that water land border. Lots of ways of doing this. Um, what I'm doing is I'm gonna use uh, an edge detection algorithm from OpenCV. It's called the uh, canny edge detection. Uh, I won't go into how it works really, but 
in general, what it does, it looks for a, a spike or a slope in like intensity of pixels. So um, it'll look for where there's edges, I guess. <laughs> I don't really know how else to say it. Yeah. And in this case, there's a pretty sharp edge, right, where the water meets the land. So I'm going to use, in this case, the land difference mask. So this, where there's an, an obvious edge, right? So I'm going to try and detect this edge here and this edge here. So this edge is where the land started, or yeah, where the land started in 2017. And now this edge here is where the land starts in 2023. And if you can measure the distance between the two, you can measure how much land was lost or how much coastline was receded, and you can measure you know, how fast it receded. So let me scroll down. So we're going to take that land difference mask, throw it into uh, it wasn't it was a float earlier, so I'm going to turn to some integers, and then we'll detect all the edges. Zero being one threshold, one being the other, because it's a mask. <clears throat> and then let's just take a look at what that looks like. So the canny edge detection did a good job of detecting edges. Like I mentioned earlier, 2017 land or coastline on the left, 20, 20, 2023 coastline on the right. And then, um, well, we'll do a histogram. So what we're going to do here is we're going to try and automatically detect, like not just by pointing and clicking, but just like getting the computer to just detect where the where the um, coastline was in 2023. And, on, and, on 20, and in 2017. So I'm just going to bin up all the pixels vertically and where I'm just going to try and say where all the pixels binned up on the left and all the pixels binned up on the right are, on average, are going to be the two coasts. There's lots of ways of doing this. Um, you can already imagine this won't work for an image where the coast is horizontal. And in this case, the coast on the 2023 side is already kind of sloped just from how it's been receding. So it's going to be kind of like, mm, not so good, but it'll be okay. So let's bend them up. And then um, I'm going to use a SciPy algorithm called Find Peaks to find the peaks. Uh, I'll show you in a second what this means. Um, here's my histogram. So here are where all of the pixels are binned up vertically on the left side of the image and on the right side of the image. And I'm going to find that I found the peaks of the two histograms. And these are supposed to be where the coastlines are. And let me just plot that on top of the land mass difference. OK. So you can see, well, it's kind of hard with this light here, but uh, this is where all of the pixels were binned up. And it does a pretty good job of like saying, roughly on average, this is where the coastline was in 2017. And um, you know, we, we started this this tutorial in 2022 for a sci-fi presentation. And back then, uh, this coastline wasn't so eroded, wasn't as eroded, and it did, a, it did a pretty good job of capturing this section here. But it's gotten, as I said, it's gotten worse. And so with this new data, it's kind of capturing over here because the river is getting wider, um, which is a whole separate issue. But in general, kind of, this is where the 2023 coastline resides for the bottom part. You can picture that as the bottom part of the, of the image. And then let's measure it. So the land has receded basically two and a half kilometers over the past seven years, uh, which averages out to like 356 meters per year, which is uh, pretty dramatic. I don't know miles, so you can just kind of divide by 1.6 and put that into miles. Uh, yeah, and that's our coastline analysis. Um, do you have any other questions? If not, I'll just throw it back to this. Uh huh, yeah. Well, <laughs> we can just have fun in Python. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, some, something we could do is we could relay this information to the government. So something like that a lot of, a lot of 
government agencies do is they, they task satellite data or they get, they get plant data like this and then they, they do this analysis themselves to just try and see where, in this case, where coastline is receding most. Um, and then they can begin to be like, oh, shoot, like up here, not, we don't need to do anything about it. Like nothing's, nothing, nothing to worry about up here. No seawalls need to be put in. Down here though, it's, it's getting pretty bad. We have to start to implement something, right? Like, and maybe they have, but maybe that's why it's getting a little bit better. Um, and so that's just, or you know, another thing they can do is, let's say they have people who live here. I mean, this is such a zoomed out picture you can't really see, but maybe there are people who live here or there's farms or other important infrastructure. They can begin to warn them, be like, look, it's moving at a rate of 300-ish meters per year. You're next, <laughs> you know, you need to move. Um, and that's actually something that's happened in, in the UK. There was another example I was gonna use maybe, but I didn't to use this one, it's a little more dramatic, where they had to move an entire city, you know, a few kilometers inland because the, the coast was just so dramatically receding. Yeah. Just further on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Totally. Yeah. There's so many, so, so many ways of doing this. Yeah. Of course, the year mark is is like the most dramatic way of doing it. It's like the most smooth data. You can definitely do a temporal resolution of every day. The problem with a lot, there's a few problems with that. But an issue with that is like seasonal seasonal changes. So like this region, this region has monsoon season. So like there's a I can't say this for certain, but there's a good chance that a lot of the erosion happens during that monsoon season where there's a lot of wind and a lot of waves and probably deteriorates a lot of that soft land. Um, but yeah, I mean, pulling this down to like quarterly or monthly, every bi biweekly or even daily could be interesting. You probably see a lot of, a lot of noise, but you probably see pull a pretty decent pattern out of it over like a month or something if you did daily. Um, the natural coastal erosion versus the maybe more dramatic. So if you had daily data, maybe you could look at what is the baseline for this region. And then if there's monsoons or if there's like big weather events or something, how does that change? You could also potentially look at that as well, I think. Cool. It's almost like your question was planted. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I do think it's valuable to talk about what we can do. Um, I think the first is just to build awareness. Here in Salt Lake City, we're landlocked. We don't have a body of water unless you count the Great Salt Lake, which is also drying up. Um, so I, I guess maybe that doesn't count either. Um, but just like learning about coastal erosion uh, and how it could impact your community if you live in an area that's by the water, um, that in itself helps a lot connecting with your communities. In a lot of places, there's like local government organizations, community organizations, nonprofits, things like that, who are already working to understand the local impacts and effects of coastal erosion. Um, and then finally, because this is PyCon, I think this is important. Data plays a huge role in this, um, especially, uh, I think now we have greater availability of satellite imagery and just environmental data in general. So I think that also helps just being more informed and then using these skills that you now have to kind of dig into things a little further wherever you can find data. And Planet um, luckily makes this easier to do. So I wanted to share with you all some resources that we have at Planet that might be of interest to you if you're interested in poking around at this use case or other use cases. The first is this planet gallery. So here you can see, I know the internet is really slow. Um, so this isn't all of our imagery, but they are highlights of images that planet takes. And you can filter these images based on whatever agriculture, civil government, um, there's all different kinds of categories. 
And so these are just sort of, they're really cool images, like little case studies of different areas. If you're interested in playing around, this is free and available to use on the Planet website. It's the Planet Gallery. We also have this disaster data sets um, sort of area on our website that is made available. So this, um, I don't know when is the last one they sent out actually, but for big natural disasters, um, natural and man-made, um, we collect imagery and then make it available to people so that you can look at it. Um, I know one of the things we have under this umbrella is Ukraine data. We have a lot of Ukraine data that people have used to kind of help efforts there as part of this disaster data um, thing. So you can sign up for email alerts and things uh, when new data sets are available here. Um, we also have the NICFI program. So I'm actually blanking on what NICFI stands for. Oh, right here. Um, Norway's International Climate and Forests Initiative Satellite Data Program. So what this is, um, this makes planet data available as an open good to anyone working to reduce or reverse the loss of tropical forests. So there's tons of tropical forest data here. Um, I think there's a map here somewhere. Yeah, right here. So in all of these regions across the globe, this data is free and available to use if you're looking into forest forestry issues. There's also the Planet DevTrial program. Um, this is something that is uh, on our team. We're on the developer relations team, so this comes through to us, where if you're someone interested in using Planet data, maybe you want to just test it out as a developer and see what you can do with it. Um, our DevTrial program is a way you can do that. I'll come back to this hopefully when it's, oh, there it is. Yep, so a DevTrial program, and then you can sign up there. We also have our ENR program, which stands for Education and Research. This, um, through this program, uh, let's see. Where did it go? Through this program, all researchers funded by any US federal agency um, and or the National Science Foundation, you have access to Planet's archive of satellite imagery. So if you have um, an EDU email address or something like that uh, associated with one of these um, agencies, you can get data through this program for free. Oops. And last one. This is a link to Planet Publications. So this is one use case that we showed that we kind of turned into an analysis using Planet data. But if you're interested in how have other people used Planet data, what kind of applications and analyses have been done, we have this whole thing, a whole collection of different publications where people have used planet data and done like written papers or analyses or um, released code or things like that. So all of that is available here. Feel free to take a picture of this slide or anything um, if you would like to. Um, also, well. Oh, that's a good point. So if you, um, if y'all could email one of us, either me or Kevin, we can send you the presentation. And yeah, finally, um, we just wanted to give you our contact information. This um, developers at planet.com and then also the developer center, developers.planet.com. This is where if you're interested in planet imagery, using it or learning more about it, you can find everything you need to know there. Also, I highly encourage you all to take one of these flyers up here, the DevRel, um, because the notebooks and everything, all the materials we used for the presentation today. It's part of this larger effort that our team maintains. Um, we have tons of Jupyter notebooks with different um, examples and analyses and not just with planet data, but how to do things with geospatial data in general. So if you're interested in any of that, um, we would love your feedback. You can file issues or do anything, any of that stuff here. So yeah, with that, thank you all so much for coming. Really enjoyed it.